Tonight from Syria, the exclusive testimony of one British jihadi who knew the Brighton teenager and fellow jihadi Ibrahim Kamara, believed killed in a US airstrike earlier this week. You know, he was just a, a normal uh, Muslim lad. He learned about, uh, you know, his duty towards the, the people that have been oppressed, the people that have been attacked because they're Muslims. And he saw that the solution is jihad. Jihad is what's going to protect them. These bombers in the skies above Iraq could be joined by British planes as early as tomorrow night if MPs approve it. On the eve of the vote, we'll ask, is the gaping hole in the plan actually the lack of a strategy for what to do on the ground? The stories of the women who suffered at the hands of nuns in Irish convents are still being revealed, and only now are some mothers being reunited with the babies they were forced to give away. Carmel, you don't blame me for anything. No. Oh, God, no, nuts. Don't. I no. couldn't. It wasn't my fault. And it is an exhibition about slavery by a renowned South African artist. So why has the Barbican in London bowed to protesters and pulled it? An actress in the show faces a leader of the campaign. Very much indeed. The film Philomena, starring Judi Dench, portrayed one woman's experience of the horror that went on behind Ireland's convent walls. But for thousands of other women, their suffering was hidden, and it seems like the revelations just never end. The Irish government has announced another inquiry, the sixth into what went on in the institutions run by nuns for most of the 20th century. The home for single mothers, the orphanages, and the infamous Magdalen laundries. But survivors of the laundries say the report on them published last year was a sham. And what's the point of another one? Sue Lloyd Roberts has been to Ireland to speak to some of the women of the Magdalen laundries. The discovery in June that some 800 babies had died at a former mother and baby home run by nuns in Ireland and that their bodies had been put in unmarked and horribly inappropriate graves shocked the world. It's a sewage tank. Why are there children buried in a sewage area? The subsequent outrage emboldened survivors of the homes run by nuns for single mothers all over Ireland to speak out. There was thousands of babies born here. There was hundreds of them died, and I remember the nuns carrying down the little brown shoe boxes to bury the children. There have been five inquiries into Ireland's religious institutions so far, and now there's to be another into the mother and baby homes. The survivors say they won't be fobbed off. We have found our voice, and we're not going to be silent anymore. No. They're determined, not least because earlier reports, like that into the Magdalen laundries, failed to tell the whole truth. Laundries where thousands of destitute women and those deemed to have fallen short of the Catholic Church's strict moral code were forced to work unpaid. At the birth of the Irish state in 1922, a cash-strapped government was happy to delegate most welfare duties to the religious orders, which meant that a girl who was born in a mother and baby home might go on to an orphanage, which were aptly called industrial schools at the time, and then on to a Magdalene laundry. In effect, she could live and die in the care of the nuns. And the themes running through all these institutions are ones of death and mass graves. Questions about the laundries were asked when, in the early 1990s, the nuns who owned the vast High Park convent in Dublin wanted to sell the land where now there's a car park. The problem was that the plot they wanted to sell, which back in 1993 looked like an empty green field, was in fact filled with the bodies of former laundry workers. I tracked down the gravedigger employed by the nuns to dig them up, and he agreed to give his first television interview. Well, the nuns were trying to sell the place, and it was big money, like, so they didn't want anyone to know what was going on. It was all hush-hush. We were supposed to tell no one about it. The nuns told him there were 133 women's bodies buried in the plot. So we kept digging and digging, 
till we, we, we dug out the whole lot and we ended up with 22 more that, that we weren't, so we didn't even know they were there. 22 bodies that the nuns didn't even know were didn't there. Didn't even know they were there. And he found something else inside the grave. A lot of plaster of Harris, which was on their wrists and their arms, their legs, their feet, their ankles. They were broken arms and broken legs as well. That's, it seemed to me like. The women were too small, they were too frail to, for that kind of work. People were shocked by the tale of unrecorded burials and broken limbs and began to ask what had been going on in the laundries and why were so many sent there. Like Mary Merritt, who was born in a mother and baby home and sent to an orphanage where, one day, she was so hungry she took an apple from an orchard. The nuns sent her to work in a laundry in Dublin. They took me to High Park Convent and they left me there and they said, now you stay there until you learn to stop stealing. And how long did that take? I was 14 years there. Did you ever ask why you were there for 14 years for stealing an apple? Yes, I did ask them. And I asked, was I ever going to get out of here? Am I going to die here? One of my jobs was to help to lay out the women when they died. I was happy to do it because at least these women were getting out of the laundry and their suffering were over. When women like Mary told their stories, People asked how arbitrary detention and slave labour were allowed to happen. The government called on a senator, Martin McAleese, to conduct an inquiry. When he published his report last year, survivors were astounded that he didn't report on conditions at the laundries, like the former one here at High Park, despite the many women who spoke of ill treatment. This is the whole, the punishment room, and this is one of my Mary told McAleese that she was so desperate that she broke a window and ran into the town and begged a priest for help. He raped her. I'd never been out in the world in my life. And I had no idea what was going on. I was crying my eyes out and I said, you're hurting me. Then when he was finished, he said, now, this is between us. I'm going to give you sixpence, he said, and this is between us, he said. Don't tell anybody. I said, I'm only trying to help you, he said. The police took her back to the laundry. The nuns didn't believe about the rape and put her in the punishment cell for running away. One of the nuns came down then and she cut my hair to the bone. And then I was taken up and I was made kneel in a, a room with all the women there, kneel down, kiss the floor and say, I'm oh, sorry for what I did. By this stage, Mary had been there for 12 years and was afraid that she might never get out. After all, there were women who died there. Sue, that was my friend, Mary Brehenny. She worked in the Magdalen Laundry for 56 years. And yet, according to the McAleese report, the average or median duration of stay in the laundries was approximately seven months. By comparing headstones with electoral rolls, Claire McGetterick discovered that for one ten-year period, most women at the High Park Laundry were there for a minimum of eight years. We've looked at electoral registries, for example, from 1954 to 64, um, and looking at High Park in particular, um, we've been able to show that at least 46% of these women from 1954 to 64 never got out. I asked the nuns who ran the laundry where Mary worked for an interview, but they refused. So Mary and I called on the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity headquarters in Dublin. Good morning. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Um, my name is Sue Lloyd Roberts. I'm here from the BBC, and this is Hi. Mary Merritt, a former Magdalene laundry worker. You've already sent in a request, and I think you've got your answer to that Which request. Which is no. We have been refused and an I interview, but we I still have some very important questions to ask. All I wanted was, please, somebody to give me an apology for what happened to me. No. She said, That's all I wanted. We were clearly not going to be invited in. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Senator McAleese also turned down my request for an interview, 
but I was invited to meet with Ireland's Deputy Prime Minister. When I speak to these women, what they want is the truth to be told. Well, we now have underway the process for preparing uh, a full uh, judicial report by a very experienced judge who has been involved so in you'd a number... So you admit the McAleese inquiry was less than thorough? Well, the McAleese inquiry uh, was an inquiry at a point in time. I think the critical thing that it achieved was recognition uh, for what women had experienced and what women had gone through. But, but the women themselves say it didn't, because, well, for example, the glossing over of the abuse, the duration of stay... Well, I do know... Um, that what is important for a lot of the women is that they would receive uh, a redress payment. Compensation, or redress as it's called in Ireland, is being paid to former laundry workers. But the Irish taxpayer is footing the bill. The nuns say they can't afford it. The nuns told McAleese that they didn't make money from their laundries, which is odd, because we found an old ledger from 1980 at a museum in Dublin for the High Park Laundry where Mary worked, showing a very healthy business. We have here the airport, one of the country's main train stations, airlines, government departments like the Department of Fisheries. There are hotels, private individuals, convents and seminaries. No wonder trade unions and commercial laundries complained at the time. They were competing against the nuns whose overheads didn't include wages. They had free, forced labour. And after the laundries closed, the nuns made even more money from property sales. They now have assets estimated at over one and a half billion euros, but have refused to give any to the Magdalene survivors. That's you when you were a baby. Oh. When they took you away from me. After Mary was raped, she gave birth to a daughter, Carmel. Yes, the baby was taken by the nuns and put up for adoption, and Mary was sent back to work in the laundry. For 40 years, she only had a photo. You have to keep them forever now. Oh, I will. Never let oh, them I'll go. I'll treasure them. Yeah. I will treasure them. They will go into frames. Mary now lives in the UK. A few years ago, with the help of British social workers, Carmel found her. Mary is desperate to assure her daughter that she didn't give her away willingly. Carmel, you don't blame me for anything. No. Oh, God, no, nuts. Don't. I no. couldn't. It wasn't my fault. But we're just not ashamed anymore, and that's the end of it. And we are going to speak out, and we are going to fight back. Survivors argue that all the religious institutions are linked and they should be investigated together. Mm. Justice for our mothers mm. and for yeah. the babies to mm. see her. But the indications are that when the government announces the parameters of the new inquiry any day now, it'll have a narrow remit. They don't want to join the dots, we believe, between the Magdalene laundries, the mother and baby homes, the illegal adoptions and literally they want to do as the least amount possible. I mean, as it is, the United Nations Committee complained that the McAleese report wasn't independent enough, that it wasn't thorough enough, and we believe that this is what's going to happen again with the next report. The survivors of the laundries are afraid that in their case, the whole truth will never be told. I want somebody to apologize to me, the nuns, the church, the priests, just somebody to apologise to me before I die. Sue Lloyd Roberts.